part of the research project that Emily and I were involved with Bronson and, and Dr. Damaris was, and this was the point of your thesis. This was this. So this was actually the point of Emily's thesis. As I said, like she had a main thesis and then mine kind of spurred off of it. This was her project was if we took bucks from all of these different soil regions, right. And we put them into research facility pens and we let them all get to the same age. Mm -hmm. We fed them the exact same thing in the exact same conditions. Number one, do the coastal plain deer eventually catch up to the delta deer because they have better nutrition? They're in the same environment. If they don't, is it significant of a difference or is it multiple generations? Meaning those deer that we capture from the wild and put in never catch up. It's genetic. But the yeah. next breeding cycle of deer from the coastal plain have fawns and those fawns then grow up to older bucks do catch up or don't they? What'd you find out? Is that a fair? Yeah. I'm trying to yeah. recap my wife's thesis, which is probably pretty poor. <laughs> from, uh, from 11 years yeah. ago. And knowing Emily, she's going to have some words with you. Yeah, about she, it. Well, anything that we missed. The first comment on the YouTube video is, that's incorrect. Don't listen to this guy. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't know this what he's talking wrong. about. Let, let me reduce it like this, Jeremy. <laughs> the, uh, the, the ultimate question was, is it the environment that's causing antlers to be small and bodies to be small? Or is it genetics? So mm -hmm. is it nutrition or is it genetics? That was kind of to summarize the ultimate question. And I mean, that's the, you, you know, you and I talked about it before, but from a hot topic button issue, genetics and deer. It, and, and I feel like, especially in the South, we don't talk about it as much in the North or the Midwest, but in the South, you want to talk about a hot button issue, you know, because the people in the coast literally will say, yeah, we just have shitty genetics. That's why we don't grow big there deer. Are still the genetics probably are. some people that think that I, I do, at least myself, I think a lot of people have maybe just accepted that they can't impact that as much as they might have once thought. So I guess from by, that, by killing certain from that segment, not. Bronson, um, and, and obviously Emily and I were there through, you know, really the end of gen one or the original, then into the, the gen one breed and then part of two, but not much, you know, what, what are you, what do you guys conclude or what, what are you working towards a conclusion on with that? Yeah, well, I, I think we do have a, a conclusion. And just what I was talking about a moment ago and how we we took a decade of research and we didn't just keep it at the university or in journal articles. We produce, I don't know if you can see this, uh -huh. an extension publication. It's essentially a, a, a popular article that tells the, the whole story written in, in language everybody can understand. What, what we essentially found is that... Uh, it's the environment. However, it's nutrition. Those deer, uh, and it just so happens that that's in the coast here. It could it could be anywhere in the U.S. where nutrition is limited. And uh, but what it took was time. And so I think what we really uncovered, and and other people had discovered this, but but I think what we were able to show very well is that this process called epigenetics. So it's not solely genetics, but it's epigenetics, meaning that genetics are influenced. The expression of your genetics are influenced by the environment. Um, mm -hmm. And so it literally took these genetic uh, or environmental cues to a doe while she has fetuses, while she is gestating these fetuses, signals are sent to that fetus saying, Conditions are really good or conditions are very limited. Those signals uh, really tune up the genes, cue the genes to be expressed or not. So what is very powerful about that from, you know, evolutionary perspective is those little tiny South Mississippi deer. They have the same genetics to grow large like an Iowa deer or a Midwestern deer, uh, the, the expression of them is just being suppressed by the environment. Mm -hmm. But but it's not just a, uh, hey, we're going to go out and plant some food plots, or if you're into supplemental feeding, we're going to put out some bags of feed and deer are going to get big. No, 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 no. no it doesn't happen like that. It's intergenerational, meaning that mother has to grow into a, a better environment. And then she sends signals to her fetuses that turn into fawns that they can grow a little bit bigger. The environment's good. It's safe to grow bigger. Think about it. If you're genetically programmed to grow to 300 pounds in an environment that doesn't support you to be a 300-pound deer, you die. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So, so that is a way to, to protect that individual to survive. Yeah. And so these intergenerational cues, what we found is that in two generations, just two generations, now for a human being, that yeah, was that's a long to time. 10 years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We don't like to accept that. Yeah. But those little deer that weighed 30 and 40 pounds less and that their antler size, Boone and Crockett score 20 to 30 inches less in those two generations, they had completely equaled our better deer that we find in the Delta, our agricultural environment deer. Um, So we we feel like we kind of uncovered that process. So, I mean, I guess from that standpoint, Bronson, like, and let's take this holistically, even outside of Mississippi and into the entire Whitetail range, you know, is it before you say that, I'm just curious in conducting that study, did you grab deer from each of these locations and bring them into a high fenced area? That, that, that's precisely what we did. So, uh, around 30, we, we started with pregnant does. So adult does that lived their entire life free ranging in these very different regions that have very different nutrition. Those pregnant does were captured, brought to Mississippi State to our research facility. Once their fawns were born, the adult does, they're out of the study. They're no longer part of it. So now we're on an even playing field. All those fawns are given the exact same nutrition for their entire life. Mm-hmm. But, but what was so fascinating, Jeremy, you remember all the head scratching that was going on then. That first generation, now think about this, even though we have buck fawns, as soon as they were weaned mm-hmm. until three years of age, they had the exact same diet, these three different groups. Living in the exact we, same location. We didn't see any difference. Yeah. You mm-hmm. th- now, now how, how can that be? We've got 30 or 40 buck fawns that were given the exact same diet as these from the good region. We didn't see any difference. But keep in mind, their mothers were from a region mm-hmm. where they were nutritionally stressed. So they were still and, and programmed the, at that point to have that smaller frame, smaller antler. To maximize their survival in an environment where nutrition is limited. That's cool. Exactly. So you're, the term is epigenetics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Which so epi around it. surrounding genetics, epigenetics. Yeah. yeah. So that's Very where, cool. like, you think about in today's society, I mean, again, in the South more than probably anywhere else, we start tossing around this genetics world, word so much. You know, even if for an entire generation, and again, this is an enclosed population, right? We've, we've put these deer in. There's no um, immig- immigration or immigration, you know, happening. It's closed population. You know, if you went in and did the the utmost um, management on the habitat and food plots and supplemental feed, and you provided your deer with everything, it still you're still going to have deer coming from other properties yeah. that aren't getting that, and you're going to have deer from your property leaving from that. But you would still have to do effectively at least two generations of deer. Yeah. You know, so what six to ten years? Um, yeah, exactly. In order to show the maximum possible genetics that that deer has Mm -hmm. somewhere in its system or that herd has somewhere in its system. I'd be curious to know too, if you guys itemized out like all of the, the variables that contribute to that epigenetic i'm not a yeah i'm probably saying that wrong which no, basically just what makes a deer big you know because there's things that feed into it like nutrition yep. age so location, age was the same nutrition was the genetics. same es- essentially we're trying to eliminate these other factors right to to find out if it truly was a genetic difference mm-hmm. because so bronson i guess let's back up a second there give these guys a little bit of history on mississippi in terms of the restocking efforts because this is the root of why we search this out not only the fact that we're seeing smaller deer in the coastal plain than we are seeing in the delta but historically there were deer restocking efforts in mississippi i do want to clarify too we're saying in terms of size is that in reference to body weight and antler antler score but crockett score correct those are the two that were our two metrics yep Mm -hmm. (laughs) Crazy. Yeah, so That's Mississippi, crazy. much like the the southeastern U.S. And, and some places in the Midwest, but not as much, uh, deer were for the most part extirpated. So local uh, local extinction, they were completely gone as a combination of, got to think way back, you know, there was market hunting, over hunting, no regulations, and there's no habitat. You got to look back at pictures from the 30s and 40s. We didn't have deer habitat. You know, everything's agriculture yeah. back then. Everybody's farming cotton or whatever. Mm. Um, deer were uh, largely absent from the landscape. So 
a massive restocking effort occurred all over the southeast. So within Mississippi, just for example, there are deer brought in from Wisconsin, different places up north, yeah. deer brought in from Texas, deer brought in from Mexico, Kentucky, all over the place. And we typically think that, and it's kind of logical for a human to go. I had a border hopper I'll, joke there. I thought I should hold it myself. <laughs> <laughs> no walls back there. They brought them over in cages, right? <laughs> we, the, we, we attribute this legacy of restocking. We connect it and think, I, I bet those deer that are really big, those were the deer that were brought in from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Seems logical. The, the yeah, yeah, you, you could think that. Uh, the deer that were brought in uh, that are in South Mississippi, those are probably the ones brought in from Mexico or, yeah. or something like that. That became kind of conventional wisdom that that is what's going on. Mm. So, Jared, that kind of then led to, well, what we need to do management wise is let's do another restocking. Let's take a deer from our Delta region and let's restock them, you know, down in South Mississippi. And then we're going to have these bigger deer down there. Mm. And that, that was literally uh, being discussed. That, that was taken very seriously at the time. And that was the impetus for this very research project was, uh, okay, let's do a deep dive in this and see if we can sort this out. Uh, and, and that led to uh, kind of reverse engineering. Well, Let's take these deer that are really, really small in South Mississippi, and let's just give them the same nutrition that they have in the Delta, and let's see see what they do. Mm. Coincidentally, a, another research project that we did, it all kind of dovetails very, very nicely, uh, was looking kind of at genetics in Mississippi and all throughout the Southeast. There is very little evidence that we have any northern genes left in Mississippi. Uh, it was really because simultaneously in Mississippi, again, like in other states, there were pockets of populations in places that were not as accessible or were not as farmed as heavily. So we had some populations on the uh, Mississippi River. We had some populations further down south where there were existing viable. Some of those deer were also trapped and restocked. Those were the ones that were more successful because they were evolved and adapted to a southern South Mississippi environment and the diseases that kill northern deer when you bring them down it's south. Take me.